Вот это выгодные улицы, рядом нас выгодные улицы. Сказали, дети сказал, мы дети, дети. Очень хорошо сказал, бросил, дети тоже убили. Все убили. Я скажу среди всех, гуманитарная помощь нам не надо, нам дайте оружие, если у вашей силы она есть. Мы с ним сами справимся. Нам другого помощь не надо, нам только оружие дайте. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Ladies and gentlemen, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to the Black Banners podcast. This is the second episode of the second season and today we are cracking open the story of Baysanger of Benoy or the Stone Man. Baysanger is particularly a tenacious warrior and as you will hear from his story, he's one of the most legendary warriors to ever come out of the Chechen highlands. Now, similarly to the last episode and as you will notice almost immediately, not much is really known about the childhood of Beysanger. In this particular case, it is because nobody really got the opportunity to simply sit down with Beysanger or his family and really get to know who he was. So most of the information known about Beysanger today comes from first-hand accounts from his comrades and his terrified Russian counterparts. Beysanger was born to a peasant family in the village of Benoy in 1794, it's the same year that Sheikh Mansur, the leader of the Caucasian resistance, passed away. The very moment that Beysanger was old enough to hold a weapon and hit a shot, he took up arms to support the resistance against the Russians. So this was around 14, 13 years old. You see, Beysanger belonged to the clan of Bino, one of the most legendarily quarrelsome Chechen clans in all of the Caucasian highlands. So it was no surprise that he joined the resistance against the Russians almost immediately. It was actually expected of him. Before 1810, Beysanger was fighting for the Chechen leader, Baibulat Taimiev, starting his lifelong rivalry with the Russians as a mere teenager. He was extremely active and engaged in organized skirmishes with the Russians for a very long time. They finally realized that despite their great numerical advantage, they could not rush the caucus by force. They couldn't just storm their way in like Western imperialist armies always love to do. Fighting Sheikh Mansur and the early Caucasian resistance made the Russians realize something. Their counterparts were the most organized, unorganized army they've ever encountered and this made them extremely deadly. The natural way they molded and combined like a joint to connect a noxious blow to the jaws of the Russian army, despite their lack of structured regiment, made them flow together like an absolute monster of a machine. The Caucasus was an unorganized, impenetrable hellscape for the Russians, an extended 1.4,000 kilometer fortress defended by the stubborn and pugnacious wolves of the Caucasus. The Russians decided they had to finish this through slow, grueling siege warfare, going village by village and fortress by fortress, taking key locations one at a time. But this didn't make them immune to attacks from the Highlanders, often surprising the Russians by rushing and ransacking their supply lines from the dense forests of the Caucasus. And Beysanger was one of the Shabab. As a young man, he was hankering for the blood of the enemy, prowling near major roads that were concealed by Chechen forests, waiting for the Russians to show their presence. Around 1834, when Beysanger was 40, communication across the Caucasus began, and Imam Shamit of Dagestan came in contact with Beysanger and the Chechen Mujahideen. The Russians had started to put a lot of pressure on the imamate. They started breaking down the defenses of Shamil and trying to corner him and the resistance. The Russians hated resistance, but one thing they hated more was united resistance. They knew that no matter how grueling the defenses of the Caucasus was, as long as the Highlanders fought separately, it was only a matter of time before the bear could finally just capitulate the entire structure of the Caucasian fortress. But if the Caucasus had ever managed to organize properly and face the Russians together in a structured manner, the Russian invasion would not only take so much longer, it might have been a catastrophic failure. Anyways, back to Beysanger. 
Until the year of 1839, not much is known about the warrior. He was a regular infantryman for the Chechens, sabotaging and surprising Russians where he met them. But it was this year in 1839 that Shamil took refuge in Benoy. It was following the siege of Akhulgo in August of 1839, where Shamil and his pregnant wife and son and a few soldiers narrowly escaped the deadlock by lowering themselves from the high cliffs down to a cave, where they sent a dummy raft downstream and trekked the other direction. So basically, um, they fooled the Russians into thinking that they went one way and they went the other way, to put it in simple terms. The pursuit of the Mujahideen by the Russian troops was heating up, and the Imam needed sturdy support to grind the advance of the Russians to a halt, and that support would soon come from the rock-ribbed gung-ho villagers of the Benoy region a nightmarish counterpart for the Russians, soldiers who could only be halted when their soul was removed. A Russian officer described the Mujahideen in his diary. They were animated by heroism. Besides, their courage was strengthened by the greed of prey. This was also around the same time Shamil's wife gave birth to his son, Muhammad Shafi, and this was the same moment that the legendary Emir was given charge of the Imamate. Imam Shamil was made commander-in-chief of Chechnya in 1839 with the help of Beysangar who softened the hearts of the Chechens towards the foreigners. What an eventful year. The entourage described Shamil's visit to Benoy. We stopped in the village of Bayan, the inhabitants of this village honored and treated them. The owner who received Shemin as a guest even came to Tatahi in order to invite him to visit him. The Chechens and the Avars locked in and stood toe to toe and shoulder to shoulder to face the Russian enemies together. And on January of 1844, the Chechens addressed their Russian counterparts. Since the appearance of your low feet on our cramped lands and mountains, you have always deceived our people with unjust words, with your own and forgeries, which is indecent for prudent and brave people. This is a rough translation, by the way. They went on to say, However, do not think that we fear and retreat. On the contrary, we have taken an oath in the name of God, the Quran, the Bible, and the Gospel, and the Zalter, and fighting hard with you until both sides are dwindled in their last or until you leave our places. Things between the Highlanders and the Russians started to spark up again on May 31st, 1845, when a massive swarm of Russian troops began marching in the direction of the forest of Dargo in close pursuit of Imam Shamil and his men. 21 combined battalions, four companies of sappers, 1,600 cavalrymen, all marching in the direction of the forest of Dargo in hopes of capturing the great Imam Shamil. Finally, on July 6th, 1845, over 18,000 Russians overlooked the dense Chechen highlands before intruding on the ominous district of Dargo. This massive force also included several non-combatants. A high number of Russian nobles and diplomats came to witness the battle themselves, what they thought would be the final crushing blow that would capitulate the resistance of the mountain Mujahideen. As the Russians descended deeper and deeper into the Chechen forests, they were not aware that they were descending into to their own hell. They were now deep in territory they knew nothing about, and soon they would find out it's harder to get out of the Chechen highlands than it is to get in. For the next 15 days, the Russians saw zero sleep, constantly facing several attacks from several directions. Every time they shut their eyes, their ears would hear the rumbling of the Ichkarian horsemen. They were blind and fighting in the dark. The Highlanders waited atop hillsides and mocked the Russians as they passed through. When the Russians sent Imperial General Lebinstev with a contingent to climb the hill and find them, they found nothing. And as they turned to return with the main forces of the Russians, the Mujahideen emerged from behind them and fell upon them from the sides and the rear, killing 187 of them. The hill was then retaken by the Chechens. A Russian general wrote in his diary regarding his fourth day in hell, the Highlanders took advantage of these circumstances and opened the most vigorous and cruel attacks. The policemen who made up the left chain were almost completely cut down. The company of the Kura regiment, which was in the right line, stretched out, lost his people, and was completely confused. A terrible chaos occurred in the wagon train. The Highlanders burst into the middle of it, grabbed the soldiers by the slings, killed them, and robbed everything, what came to hand. Gold and silver coins were spilling down on the road from the sakvas cut with sabers and daggers, from the wineskins pierced by bullets, 
poured alcohol on the ground in bottles, lay expensive wine, and a lot of food supply bought by the sutlers for the detachment. The soldiers greedily rushed to secure their loot and immediately died from well-aimed shots of the enemy. By the 13th of July, the Russians only had around 5,000 troops left, and almost a fifth of that in wounded soldiers. The Russians dragged out of the woods as efficiently as they could with support from reinforcements, losing a hefty amount of men and leaving an entire party behind. Their retreat was described in the diary of the Russian officer. He probably did not imagine that after his departure the column was stopped and that the head battalion seized with panic and fear refused to go to the rubble. General Pasek could not persuade the confused soldiers nor resurrect their courage. The battalion in question belonged to the 5th Corps. Each step of our movement was given to us at the cost of dozens of our soldiers killed and wounded. The soldiers, having lost their brave and best officers, did not want to listen to anybody. They fled in a crowd. The remaining party of Tsarist was encircled by the pack of mountaineers and devoured as they tried to scurry to safety. The officer portrayed the situation in his log. There are no words to describe those soul-rendering scenes that took place in the midst of this fatal massacre between the enemy and us, despite the superiority of our forces. He then goes on to aggressively criticize the Russian generals and colonels, questioning their choice to enter the forest in the first place. It was such a terrible idea. It was terrible on paper. It was terrible in real life. Yet they still went forward with it because they thought that since they had a higher number, numerical superiority, they would simply win. They would simply stomp on the enemy. But that's not the case in a dense forest like Dargo and against a tenacious enemy like the Chechens. Things started to slow down significantly for the Russians following this. They were very timid about entering the Chechen highlands again, and they decided that they had to pull and re-strategize their entire plan in the region. They pretty much put all their operations in Chechnya on hold. Now there's a story in Chechen legend that alleges the way that Beysenger actually lost his arm and his eye and it was apparently in a duel with a Russian loyalist. Now it was around the year 1846, I'm estimating, because this was uh, after he had met Shamil and surely after the Battle of Darko, but before he lost his leg. So I am going to estimate around the year 1846. The Russians lightened the pressure they placed on the Highlanders temporarily as they redrew their plans for annexing the region. So the Russians were temporarily pulling back because of what had happened in the Battle of Dargo. The Highlanders were in the presence of some Cossacks who were loyal to the Tsar, basically Russian proxy soldiers. Beysanger challenged the bravest among them to come out and face him in a duel. One of them finally rode forward, and they unsheathed their sword at the emergence of the other. The duel was bloody, and it started to look like Beysanger was going to fall. But after landing a few thick swings at the other, Beysanger turned around and started riding back towards his comrades. And as he got closer to his men, they noticed that he was seriously injured, missing an arm, suffering a bloody wound to his left eye, and a massive gash to his chest. Shaman scolded the warrior, angry with him for risking his life and not winning the duel. But Beysanger told him to turn around, and all eyes fell on the Tsarist horseman, who was sitting unmoving on his horse. But as soon as the man's horse took a step, the head of the soldier rolled backward and his body forward. Separating at the neck, his head bounced off the horse and rolled onto the dirt, and his body collapsed from the horse. And that is allegedly the story of how Beysanger lost his arm and his eye. In 1847, the Russians were besieging a mountain fort of the Highlanders in Dagestan. It was during this encounter with the Russians that a cannonball took the leg of mighty Beysanger right from beneath him. Unconscious and bleeding out, he was captured by the Russians in the dark of the night. The news of his capture ringed around the Caucasus, and Shaman wasn't happy about it. He took charge of a detachment that aimed at locating their captured brethren. The Mujahideen found out that he was being transported out of Dagestan and towards the fortress of Groznaya and located the convoy before it could make it out. Zulta Murad, a childhood friend of Beysanger, led a surprise attack on the convoy and freed his captured comrade, smashing the convoy and grabbing their friend. They were expecting to take Beysanger to his home village to rest and maybe even retire at this point considering he was missing a leg now. But Zolta Murad was left with his jaw on the floor as Beysanger tied himself to his horse with a rope and rode off to protect the village of Salto. He wants nothing more than to die fighting, Shamil wrote about the warrior. Beysanger was described further. 
He was tied to his horse with leather straps, and the fearless Naib snatched a saber with his one hand, and sparkling with his one eye, rushed into the thick of the enemy. Now, at this point, the Russians were working on burning down the Caucasus. They were pretty much clearing much of the forests and capturing the forts to make it easier to pinpoint enemies and also to thwart ambushes and to make the terrain more familiar to the flatland-loving Russians. Which, by the way, you'll see this behavior repeated by Imperial armies often. In the Vietnam War, the American military was actually using Agent Orange and other chemicals to burn down the Vietnamese forest so they can pinpoint, you know, guerrilla warriors. The guerrilla soldiers were actually causing them a lot of devastation and the jungle was perfect for concealing their position, and so a large army like that can't really hide in this massive jungle, and they don't know the terrain, and so the best they can do is burn everything down. During this time, the Russians were attempting a quick surprise siege of the village of Jerjabil. They wanted to just blitz the village and just take it, pretty much. General Vorontsov pushed his forces forward towards the village and received little fire in return, which made him think that it was going to be weakly defended. The invaders placed their ladders and started climbing onto the first level of fortifications. And as soon as they reached the top, they fell right back down through the roof to their deaths, only to find that the enemy was waiting for them to ground themselves inside the fort. The Russian bear was now one foot deep in a bear trap and receiving heavy fire from high ground. They lost over 500 soldiers that day, and when cholera broke out in the Russian camps, General Vorontsov found his excuse to pull back. Now the Russians returned to the village of Djerjabil the next year, in June of 1848, but this time with dozens of artillery cannons. They decided taking the village by means of manpower wasn't going to happen, especially considering who was waiting for them beyond the walls. They fired thousands of shells, and after 23 long days, the Highlanders finally withdrew silently in the night as everything was being destroyed around them. The Russians found their new favorite tactic, destroy everything with artillery. The Russians couldn't hold the fort of Djerjabel either and withdrew themselves shortly after. For the next several years, until the mid-1850s, both sides were pretty much sitting in a deadlock, building up defenses and waiting for a major reaction from the other. Shemin never stopped being active, gathering men and allies and trying to tie together an organized resistance regardless of what the Russians had destroyed so far. And finally, the slow period between the Russians and the Highlanders came to a sudden halt, as the Russians finally concluded the Crimean War against the Ottomans in March of 1856. They could now concentrate all their forces on the Caucasus, a short strip that they had expected to be conquered in a few years and without a lot of men, that had now dragged on for several decades. The Russians at this point in time were aggressively trying to take the Argun River, which divided Chechnya in half, after significantly clearing much of the forests around Chechnya. By November of 1857, the Russians were on the border of Chechnya and built forts on its western edge in the village of Burtunai. The Russians wanted to separate the eastern half of Chechnya from its western half, making their conquest easier. By 1858, they were marching along the lower banks of the southern side of the river and started following its flow north, clearing forests as they moved. The Russians now wanted to storm Viden modern-day Videno, by the way, but they had learned their lesson about stumbling in recklessly before, and so they opted for a safer route. They encircled the village and slowly squeezed the defenders for two entire months, finally grinding out the city into capture by the 1st of April, 1859. Many Highlanders began to join the Russians at this point. The men from the pack were being separated from the boys, and two of the remaining men were Shamil and Beysenger. In fact, Beysenger's position as a leader of the resistance was jump-started after the capture of Videno by the Russians, when Shemel took him as an amanate. Beysenger pointed to his limbs and responded with, I received all of these wounds and injuries fighting against the Russians, and now I am no longer fit. Think about it, won't you be ashamed to take such rubbish as amanates? Better take somebody else from whom you can expect more use than from me. Beysanger had high respects for Shamil, but he did not want to take him up on his offer. He did not like the idea of having power over people, and he did not want to risk going against his principles. The Emir articulated such sweet and flattering words to the warrior, words that spoke to his heart and solidified his valiant disposition. Tash Adam, Imam Shamil called Beysanger for his unflinchingly honorable character, meaning man of stone. However, it was clear that things weren't going so well for the Highlanders under the immense amount of pressure placed on them by the massive Imperial Russian army. 
They were pushed from Botlich to Igali to Karata, and finally with the 400 remaining soldiers that Shaman had with him to Gunib. The Russians were closing in on their primary target, Shamil of Dagestan. However, there was another small thorn that the Russians couldn't seem to get out of their foot, and that thorn was in the forests of Chechnya. At this point, Beysanger was separated from Shamil. Beysanger was still in Chechnya, while Shamil was in Gunib. Finally, in late July and into early August, the Russians reached Gunib and began to surround the village. The siege of Gunib was deathly tight. It was a matter of time before the Russians closed in on the Highlanders, no matter how many men they lost in the process. 16,000 Russians led a blockade of Gunib, closing in on the Imam on August 9th and squeezing the headlock tighter and tighter over the next six days. The siege, like most others, was grueling and destructive to the land and the livelihood of the Highlanders. The Russians packed the mountain with men and fired constant artillery grinding the defenses of the Mujahideen into dust. The Highlanders couldn't find any direction in the line to slip through. There was no chink in the armor. And finally, on August 25th, 1859, Imam Shamil was captured by Imperial troops after fighting them for 25 years and the remaining 200 to 300 starving and poorly equipped defenders of the fortification were taken in with him. Beysanger had been given two medallions from the Imam upon seeing him for the final time and so when he heard of the fall of Gunib he refused to be separated from these two medallions and promised to continue to fight against the Russians until his head fell off. Now there's this strange narrative that circulates about what actually happened during the Siege of Gunib. There's a story that Beysanger was present at the Siege of Gunib and he apparently was pointing his gun at Shamil as Shamil was walking away to surrender himself to the Russians. Beysanger was holding his, his firearm towards Shamil's back and telling him to turn around. He was calling his name, Shamil, 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 urging him to turn around and Shamil ignored him and continued walking until he was out of sight. Now the reason that he didn't shoot Shamil was because it doesn't align with Chechen principles to shoot somebody in the back. You have to wait until they turn around and shoot them in the head. This story is completely fabricated. According to every primary Russian source, Beysanger was not among the final defenders of Gunib. In fact, this narrative actually comes 100 years after the war with the Tsarists. It comes from Soviet-era Russia. This version of events is significantly hindered by the geographical factors of the Siege of Gunib. It was virtually impossible to break out of the 16,000 man shoulder-tight siege and there was no ledge or edge to, you know, lower yourself down on. Like the Siege of Ahulgo, there was a ledge that Imam Shamil was able to escape from. There was no ledge like that. There was no cliffs. There was nothing. There was no way that the Highlanders could have made it out of that. And so there was no way Beysanger could have just broken through the line or slipped out of the line. That was literally physically impossible. Now these sources, however, do not disagree with the fact that Beysanger continued the resistance after the capture of Shemin. A report by a Russian colonel, Andrew 12th, says, Nearly all of the villages of Echkaria have sent deputation to Kemfort with an expression of perfect obedience. But the habitations of the village of Benoy and several farms laying along the upper reaches of the Aksai River did not follow the general example. And so a renewed resistance rose from the ashes of the Imamates. And under the leadership of Beysanger, a large contingent of warriors from the Bino tribe smashed a well-sized detachment under the command of Musa Kundokhov, which shocked the Russians. But the Chechens couldn't stop there and they continued to move on the Russian troops, but tragically they were quickly blindsided. On February 16th, 1861, a detachment under General Avdomikov caught the Highlanders by surprise and finally captured the legendary Beysanger. Well, for like the third time at this point. But this time the Russians understood that they couldn't just let Beysanger go home. They knew better than to do that now. Beysanger would not allow himself to pass away before he took as many Tsarist lives as he possibly could. And so, with the legendary warrior finally in their hands, they knew that they had to take him out or he would come back and take them. And so on the 20th of March, 1861, he was sentenced to death by hanging for treason against the Russian government. That doesn't even make any sense, but 
you know, whatever. They brought Basinger out to the main market square in Cassiavert and made him stand on a stool before a large crowd of onlookers. The executioners wanted to humiliate Basinger, and so they looked out onto the crowd before them and asked for a volunteer to come and take the stool from under the fetus. And as the mountaineer stood and uttered prayers under his breath, the crowd stared forward with eyes that screamed hope. It was almost like they expected him to pull the impossible, to escape from Russian control once again. As the executioner stood sheepishly staring at an unresponsive crowd, one volunteer finally stood up. But it was too late, Basanger had already kicked the stool out from under his own feet and passed away before the eyes of a mortified crowd many of whom were in tears. Basinger of Beno, never to be officially killed by a Russian in his 50 plus years of combat against them. And at the age of 67, the Russians finally had the lifeless body of the legendary Basinger, who had taken thousands of their comrades before. The Russians continued to face resistance in Chechnya and the North Caucasus by Abrex, lone wolf warriors who single-handedly targeted and sabotaged Tsar's positions. They fought alone in the force of Chechnya, and if the Russians didn't know before, they certainly knew now. Don't go out in the Chechen highlands alone, for you may never find your way back home. And that's going to wrap it up for episode 2 of season 2 of the Black Banners podcast, Tenacious Warriors, Basinger of Beno. Let me know if you guys enjoyed his story and what you thought about the warrior and some suggestions that you guys might have for more Tenacious Warriors in the future. And with that, I'm going to be tying up the episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Надеемся все-таки на порядочность чеченского народа, что сохранять жизнь нашим детям и что они отдадут.